All right, here we go. D.L. Hughley, welcome back to Vlad TV. Thank you, man. Ten years later, I finally get liquor and cigars. Man, oh. Ten years. <laughs> it only took ten years. We're all drinking right If I was right TK, here. you'd have I had it a long time ago. <laughs> if I was a little boozy, you'd have had it a long time ago. We're all drinking right now. Yeah. Well, since we're all drinking anyways, <laughs> let's talk about that new Freaknik documentary that's yeah. about to come out. Yeah. Uh, five prominent professionals have are trying to actually sue Hulu right. to stop this thing. Right. Did you ever go to Freaknik back yeah, in the day? Of course. Oh, okay. Of course. I, I, I never mean, went. Yeah, there was, it was in the height of, you know, Def Jam and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was something. It, it's the reason why Atlanta really, like, got on the map and a lot of people started moving there. But when I, you know, we covered the story on my show, and I think these are five, like one is a judge, uh, one is a, but I think these are people that either, you know, did some stuff that they don't want nobody to know about, or living in a, a life that's contrary yeah. to the one that'll be uh, uh, depicted in the documentary. But, but like everybody else, I think it's silly to hang a lantern on it, right? It's silly. Like everybody went to Freaknik uh, and did wild shit, is hoping that nobody sees it. Mm -hmm. They're not going to sue nobody. That like That's that's like bringing attention to it. Because the more controversial you make the documentary, the more people are going to want want to watch. Right. But now when people hear five prominent women don't want you to see it, what do you think that's going to do? Everyone's going to watch it. Of course. Yeah, look for those five prominent of women. Of course. <laughs> There'll be a screen cap up with a right. big red arrow right. to it. But it's, it's really, it's, it's something because I think it isn't that our society is different than any. Our society is different in that they will pun uh, they will penalize you for what you did. Mm -hmm. They'll go back in time, and, and you know, and uh, and the YouTube movement have has, has basically made that okay mm -hmm. to punish somebody for what they did twenty years. R, R Kelly's doing in jail for what he did twenty years ago. Bill Co Cosby in jail what he did, uh, you know, as having problems for what he did 30, 40, 50 years ago. So, if that is the predicate, you're going to have a lot of people who, who are going to look at you. And if there were, and that, that, first off, they're not just women; there are a lot of prominent men that were probably doing some shit that was inappropriate to women too. I, I'm i probably thinking there was probably more men that are scared Definitely. of what's they're happening not, right they're, now than women. They're not, gonna, they're not gonna come on. What they're gonna do is hope that this didn't happen. And right. it really, it you have to be naive to believe that whatever you doing was just an evolve, what we're doing is an evolve somewhere. And uh, you know, as I say that, as I try to reflect back over all this shit I was, but I, I just think it's foolish to try to make people, to make it bigger than it is, because if you all of a sudden, everybody's hearing about the lawsuit, and everybody's going to try to see what, 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 what is happening with it. So, What's the wildest thing that you saw, Freak Nick? A lot of sex. A lot of sex. A lot of sex. A lot just of out in the open? No, not in the open, but a lot, of, a lot of people, I'll never forget this. I saw a chick who I thought I had a crush on with two guys. <laughs> <laughs> that crush just evaporate right and I then was and like, there. Wow. <laughs> and this is true story. And she looked, hey. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. It was called Freak Nick. Right. And it was so bad. Atlanta said, Atlanta says you can't come in no more with that bullshit. It's too much. You know, you know how freaky shit gotta be for Atlanta to go, that's enough. <laughs> in the 90s? Come yeah. on, man. <laughs> oh yeah, no, listen, I, I remember I interviewed Brother Marquise from the Two mm -hmm. Live crew. And they were sort of affiliated with that whole thing yeah. in, the, in their own way. And, uh, you know, we were talking about sort of the wildest shit that was happening back then. And he said on camera that during that time, th he remembers a guy saying that he had a rape license. I remember like people. Men really felt that way. Like They felt that they could have sex with whoever they want. They, and that's that. I remember people saying, if you come over here, you're going to get fucked. I remember people saying that. Mm. And I, I, I can say this, that. That in general, my stance, my idea of what I believe is cool or not cool might have, may have been stretched, but it always had a core. And I think some of the things I saw weren't cool to me. I'm like, and even back then, and there was no, no the, the, I didn't even worry about it. I mean, sure, you, you know, you did some shit, you got high, you you fucked around and did whatever. But I, I thought it was, it was, it, it started to be so... It got it got a little to me dangerous. In what way? I thought it was dangerous for women. Mm, yeah, because it wasn't a controlled environment. No, not at all. Yeah, not at all. And it was it was so to me. I thought, I thought, 
I wouldn't want my let, let me tell you, I wouldn't want my mother, my sister, <laughs> my 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 girl, my daughters. Not, I would I wouldn't want any of them to have been around any of that stuff. But it happened. But I think trying to trying to pretend like it didn't happen and sue to make sure it happened. Well, you'll have a hard time suing because a lot of the stuff was outside and so forth, and you don't need release forms or anything of that sort. I mean, it's just very sad. I don't know how you got, and and I don't know. Maybe they, you know, have a different estimation of it. But I think, um, you twenty years ago you was buck wild, and now you're sitting in a place of prominence. Maybe you should have left, because <laughs> I, I I bet you a lot of people did wild shit and went back to Charlotte. <laughs> I mean, they did wild shit and then they went back to Cleveland. So you know right. what I mean. But you did wild shit at the place it was. A, you returned to the scene of the crime. Atlanta. I've never been there. Right. How is it? Right. I heard it was nice. Right. It, it's <laughs> just rough if you if you at, particularly if you're at the level of prominence where you're making a lot of money for a corporation who has. I'm sure they have some level of morality clause. Or if you're a judge and you you hmm. you've been pretty vocal about what your stances are on a lot of things, that could be a lot. Well, look, people evolve, people change. Sure. Uh, listen, I used to take Brazil trips back in the sure. day, and I had videos of that that you know have surfaced in various sure. ways. It just is what it is. Um, but but if you if you become somebody who is intolerant now, yeah, chances are that people are going. And we live, uh, like I said this earlier, we live in a space and time where you're indicted for your past. Mm -hmm. It's not that they, people don't just say they were kids. People indict you for your past. Well, yeah. And I mean, if you think about the current generation, all of their stuff is being, you know, saved permanently, right. whereas their parents and grandparents stuff has not been. So until, suddenly until it's until like, Freakness. oh, wait a minute. Right, right, right. I get to see. <laughs> yeah, this was Instagram yeah. back in the 90s yeah. here. OK, here we go. And, 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 and when we didn't have any concept of what that what the stakes of that would be. Mm -hmm. I remember as a young girl, she got Teen Vogue, right? She was she the first uh, black woman. Uh, to get Teen Vogue. And then they pulled up tweets from when she was in, in high school. Mm -hmm. And she lost that gig. Really? So she's 28. They went back, you know, 13 years ago. Yeah. And she lost the gig. Crazy. Uh, you know, if you look at as what happened to any number of people. Uh, Harvey Weinstein is in trouble for what he did now. He's in trouble for what he did 20, 20 years ago. Yeah. So now we live in a society that a lot of people have championed. A lot of people have thought uh, that, you know, the, the people need to be accountable. And now we will see if, if if the shit you talk about stands up to history. Well, yeah, I mean, R. Kelly, uh, recently there was these, uh, I guess, text messages that got released that was allegedly showing that uh, Azrael's parents were telling her that to... Okay, yeah. No, yeah. I saw the text messages. Yeah, that telling her to sit on his lap and and the, try to seduce that, that, him and everything else like that. That their shitty parents doesn't remove illegality. No, I, I feel like, well. Well, here's here's the thing, and you know, this is the first time I'm actually mentioning this on camera. I have an R. Kelly interview. And you never. I, I didn't put it out. Mm. I, I did it about a week ago. Uh, they had reached out to me, said he wants to do it from prison, of course. And uh, you know, we we got on the phone for 15 minutes, and. Essentially, the basis of the interview is that he is trying to show that there's sort of a conspiracy involved and so forth. And after finishing the interview, I just said, you know something, I'm, I'm just not going to put this You know out. what's interesting? I have no doubt that there are conspiratorial elements at play. No of doubt. No doubt. But I also, that, but that doesn't, that, they're not binary choice. They're not mutually exclusive. There could be a conspiratorial apparatus and you did some heinous shit. Right. It doesn't mean, like, like when people go, oh, Donald Trump, they're after him. Yeah, but that doesn't mean, they were after OJ, but that didn't mean he didn't do it. Right. They, so people make, they, they have this notion that just because somebody's after you doesn't mm -hmm. mean that they don't have a reason to be. What they say, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean somebody's not after you. Well, right, because remember that tape that was circulating yeah. long ago that, that, you know, I saw way back when, when it was, like, all over the place? Right. And it was like, okay, that's definitely R. Kelly, and that definitely looks like an underage And girl. then it was such a flimsy argument, that's not me. And it was my right. brother. And you <laughs> and you wanted to buy it because you didn't, like... Well, and the girl said it wasn't her. But then she came back in the more recent trial and said, actually, it was. He was shocked when he didn't go to jail. We were all shocked. Yeah. 
So, I mean, you got a tape. And it's his house. Like, literally, the background, I remember seeing uh, Surviving R. Kelly, and they showed the actual house yeah. with the background. I'm like, oh, that's the exact same background. And it was a very r- weird-looking room. So it's not like you could just say, oh, that could be anything. No. What does this say about a society where our sense of right and wrong is connected to a remote? Like, we didn't care about it until we saw a documentary. Mm-hmm. Michael Jackson, well, they didn't say anything about it until they saw a documentary. Like people were talking about Michael Jackson. Yeah, but I'm just talking about to the extent that the public psyche was engaged. It says a lot about a society that doesn't think something is real until you see a documentary or until Gail King interviews you. Mm-hmm. Everybody, I, I work in radio. Everybody, black radio doesn't exist without black women. Huh, okay. And they still play those songs. And it wasn't until, I think, the whole R. Kelly, surviving R. Kelly thing came out that it became a different thing. Yeah, but people still play the songs. Like, I remember there's a party down the street. Nope, nope. I I disagree. Not at radio. Well, maybe not at radio, but I'm saying there was this huge house party like across the street from us. And I remember the last song of the night was the Ignition remix. Yeah. And everyone was going crazy. Yeah. People love that music. Let me tell you something. And people, this is no secret. Nobody could beat R. Kelly in her verses. Nobody yeah, who's, who's alive who's right now? Says, yeah, no nobody one living could beat R. Kelly. Right. Not Usher, not Chris None Brown. And nobody. they know it. And they know it. They know it. Yeah. That doesn't that doesn't uh release us from the fact that some horrible things I I'm capable of of disconnecting someone's art to their atrocities. But for in mass, people reacted a different way once they saw a documentary, and those same people. Um, we're going to his concerts and playing his music. Black music doesn't, I mean, he's big because of black radio. Black radio doesn't exist without black women. Mm-hmm. It just wouldn't have. Yeah. And it's it's disingenuous to pretend like those allegations hadn't been out, that people hadn't, you know, we hadn't seen the trial, that we hadn't seen the uh, the, the the video, which mm-hmm. was child pornography, that it wasn't in the zeitgeist. And then it wasn't until it it, it was released in a documentary um, that then it engaged the public. And I think it says a lot about a society that doesn't really get activated until they see it in a documentary. Like our emotions and our eids and our sense of right or wrong is connected to a remote. And that's that's sad to me. Well, well you had called me up maybe about two weeks ago mm-hmm. and you were upset over a particular situation. Right. You want to talk about it? Scott Adams. Well, there's a Scott Adams thing. We could talk about that first. Yeah. So let's talk about the Scott Adams situation. Because, uh, so Scott Adams did a whole video saying that white people need to get the hell away from black people because they're a hate group. And when he bought a house, he first made sure that it had as few black people as possible in that neighborhood. I know Scott Adams. Mm -hmm. I'd interviewed him Mm -hmm. at that house, Uh actually. Cool guy, I'd been a fan of Dilbert forever. And since then, we've sort of kept in contact, you know, and I've had nothing but good experiences with him. So when this happened, I actually called him up. Well, I texted him. I said, hey, like, what you're saying is extremely hurtful to black people. And I'm trying to explain why. And his response was, you're being fucking racist to me. Don't ever call me again. How can I, racism is a system, and it's so hard to explain that. I'm so tired of these white victims. I don't know what the, male victims, I don't know what the fuck to do. Hmm. He made this explanation about this phenomenon about black people being racist where he, that's the reason he wanted to get away from them mm-hmm. has been happening. White people have never wanted to live around black people, ever. They enshrined it in law. It's enshrined in law. So to pretend like this is a phenomenon that's associated with an action we did hmm. or that the, it's in, Brown versus uh, Brown versus Board, separate but equal, all these things. Jim Crow were all about white people separating themselves from us. And it, it didn't have anything to do with crime. Before it was black on black crime, what was it? White flight. Compton has an airport. Do you think that was for Nickies? It wasn't. White people used to live there. When black people moved in, they left. And that was way before Dilbert. So trying to pretend like it's associated with some action that we've taken or some spike in crime, it's associated with racism. You decided you were too good to live around us and you moved and took all the resources with you. So don't pretend. Compton has an airport. You think they they didn't be there for NWA? Well, I mean, do you think that if you move into a trailer park it'll suddenly be very safe it, and, and nourishing because you're what, white is that what you think is going to happen it's funny because crime is about it's, it's, all, about it's all white people here let's all put the meth away it's, <laughs> stop doing drugs and crime it's just us whites it, here the funniest shit in the world is 
that that everybody always talks about the criminality of black people, why they shoot each other. Well, first of all, crime is about proximity. Mm -hmm. you, you, you're more likely to shoot somebody you know than you don't. Yeah. Um, 87 percent of black people kill black people. 80, the, virtually the same percentage kill white people. Right. But if you want to keep children safe instead of transgenders, you need to keep them away from white men because white men at a higher percentage than anybody else are the biggest molesters, pedophiles and rapists in the but no one ever talks about that level of criminality. Really? No. I, I didn't know that part. I mean because Look, I mean you, 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 you Mickey Minaj's brother was is a molester who's yeah, but, in prison. But right we're now. not talking about a one. I'm talking about the in the yeah. aggregate. Yeah. Okay. White men are the the biggest the, the rapist, pedophiles and look it up right now. Who does it the most? But they always talk about us shooting each other. What about you diddling who, who, who what were Catholic priests? What were they? White you what know. were the Boy Scout leaders? What were they? Usually what were right. coaches? What were they? We're talking about institutionally. I'm not talking about a one-off. So you can tell me about my drive-by. I'll explain to you criminality and drive-by shooting. And you explain to me, there's, there's, a, there's a, a, a class right now that teaches children, if you ever get a white children, if you get a duck, they look for a black man. Look it up. I'm not, you, you, you don't even have to listen to me. So if you're protecting our kids, protect them from the motherfuckers that are holier than thou. The people that are the most religious, the people that wear the robes and the uniforms. They're the ones raping and fucking kids. Uh, I'm trying to look it up. I can't really find numbers off the cuff right now. I'm not saying what you're saying is wrong. It's I'm just saying I, I can't find it. It's abs And virtually every crime in the United States, two to one, was committed black, two to one, black to white. What, what, but what, there's a higher percentage of whites than blacks see, in America. But, but no one ever adds percentages when we're talking about yeah. welfare. Nobody ever yeah, talks I mean, about listen, it. Listen, in high school, I always remember this. In my, in my government class, my teacher, Mr. Gwazin, said, there's lies, damn lies, and, and statistics. Right, right. <laughs> I mean, the statistics are worse than the worst of lies. But statistically, if you look at the institution of, there was a, a, a kid at Stanford. Mm -hmm. He raped a girl. Mm -hmm. You saw that. Remember that case, yeah. right? A judge didn't want to ruin his life. Right. So even people always talk about how black people are the the most are sent to prison for uh, uh for murder for the the most. They're also fifty percent of the people who are exonerated. So if you look at a system that if I do it is criminality, if you do it is frivolity, Donald Trump admitted to grabbing someone's pussy which is sexual assault. Mm -hmm. And you called it locker room talk. <laughs> Cuba Gooden Jr. is fucking, it had to go to trial for it. Yeah. So now you get to decide what crime is, but there is no disputing the fact that uh, per, uh, per capita, white men do the highest percentage of rape, pedophilia, uh -huh. and sexual assault in this country right now. Yeah. Well, I mean, with well, the Scott Adams thing, it was, it was crazy because he started to respond to me because, you know, before... See, see, my thing was with Scott was like, look, like Scott, you obviously have no black friends, right? It's it's very clear. <laughs> but he know, also said, he said, my black friends. All my black friends support me, right? He said, my black friends would invite me to the barbecue. Right. The niggas who invite you to the barbecue ain't invited to the barbecue. <laughs> right. Because we all live in our own echo chambers. Yeah. He exactly. asked this dumbass question. If I'd have said that, if somebody else is, if, if Scott, uh, he forgot, if he was on a, if he was on, Right, Bard. He did this uh, thing on a on a conservative uh, where they had a conservative artist. Nothing would yeah, happen. Nothing would happen because he was in two hundred and fifty newspapers, and they're they're from all kinds of uh, uh, you know backgrounds. That's why he got in trouble. Well, yeah, I mean, because his basis of his argument was it was a poll asking people, "Is it okay to be white?" That is an, an established racist term. You know, it's the, it it's the equivalent of white lives matter. Right. Where from the outside, it looks like a totally harmless statement. Of course, white lives matter. Black lives matter. Asian lives matter. Everyone's lives matter. But it's purposely set up in a, in a type of way to evoke a response. Is it okay to be white? Of course, it's okay to be white. It's right. okay to be whatever you want to be. Right. But it's designed as a statement to trigger someone's, you know, when did when did white men need triggering? 
I mean, the thing is, well, no, but, but the whole point was that certain black people in that poll said, no, it's not okay to be white. And he said, oh, see, this proves that black people are a hate group. And it's like, no, the black people understand that it's a racist term. There's an actual Wikipedia page about this. There's an ADL uh, page about this. Like, it's okay to be white has been circulating on Reddit for a long time. It's insulting for me to virtually everything Scott said, white men have been saying in this country since the inception, since us arriving here. There's been no discernible difference. If you listen to white people talking about black people from the 50s, 60s, 30s, they always had the same mindset. So what is new now is the technical apparatus. But they're feeling this. What has been taken from white men? What is there still corporate, judicial, a bank? What, what, what has been taken from them? What do they feel like they love? The only thing white people have lost the... Uh, the the, the, they have lost the ability to do is to say nigga without consequences. That's it. What else have they lost? Donald Sterling said nigga st made $2 billion saying it. Well, Joe you, Rogan well, said nigga, well, he made $150 million saying it. The Joe Rogan thing, I agree with you. Donald Sterling was forced to sell his team. Yeah, but, but the, even, the dollar amount doesn't matter. He didn't want to sell at the time. Even that, the worst that happens to you when you say uh, uh, say something as derogatory as that is you make more money. They're, the only thing that doesn't that you can't do that you used to be able to do is brutalize niggas without account and say nigga. That's all that ever happened. This you you what can't you do now that you could before? Yeah, I mean it's interesting because. Uh, um, we did an interview with Roland Martin. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't do the interview myself. Sean Perez did it. But Roland said, uh, why are white people the only group not optimistic about the USA's future? And the question was asked, are you optimistic about the future of America for your children? Every group except white people, a majority said yes. And I saw it, I went. Mm -hmm. See, some people can take stuff as on surface level and they can be, as Kathy Hughes uses her phrase, they ain't, they ain't deeper than mustard on a hot dog. Or you can now say, hold up, but what is this actually saying? And I never forget reading that, and I began to really think about it and begin to look at other different things. And we were, so John Avalon, we were at CNN, and John Avalon and I were waiting to go on. And John had written a book, book called Wing Nuts and all kind of stuff like that. So we were talking, and I said to John, I said, John, we're living in the beginning stages of white minority resistance. He was like, Hmm? I say, even though white folks are still the majority of people in this country, we are about to see with this inauguration of Obama, we're about to see white minority resistance. And so what then happens? Glenn Beck goes on. I think Obama hates white people. Uh, and then the Tea Party and then the whole resistance. Uh, to him. And then, you know, the folks sending around the images of Michelle Obama and him as monkeys and all kind of stuff along those lines. And so I then began just to look at the politics and the discourse and, and just begin just to watch different pieces. And then I remember reading a story and it may have been in Newsweek or Time. And it said the white, at that time, the white death rate in 10 states was higher than the annual white birth rate. And I was like, uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> and I started thinking about 2043. So when the story first dropped that America one day is going to be a nation majority of people of color, man, that was about 35 years ago. And I remember when it came out because I think it was supposed to be like 2060, 2055, that was going to be the case. So people were like, man, that's so far away. I'm going to be dead. But what happened? White people stopped having babies. You start looking at the birth rates for African-Americans and for Latinos. Then you start factoring in immigration. All of a sudden, that went from 2060 to 2055, 2052, 2050, 2048, 2045, then 2043. So it's like, whoa. It was a huge shrink. Then it was like by 2039, you know, the majority of the working force in America is going to be people of color. And then you start looking at the demographic shifts. And then all of a sudden, you, then you start looking at the political shifts and the economic shifts. And you begin looking at all of a sudden, then you begin to see all of a sudden 
economic anxiety. It was always applied to white people. And I was sitting there going, how are white people the only people with economic anxiety? Black folks, by and large, are broke. We should have more anxiety than anybody else. But you begin to see how the demographic shift began to dominate that. You know why? Because they have to, the idea of America, the only way uh, that black people could survive in this country is that it would get better later, the future. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. If you made a t capsule, time capsule for white people, it would go back to the 50s. If you made it for black people, it'd go back to 19, it, it would go back to 2008. When they could, there, there were things they were able to do. America looked a certain way and we couldn't talk. Yeah. And they weren't held to account. I don't, I, I've had a lot of friends who are in this business. Um, and the older they get, the whiter they get. <laughs> like they get, I'm like, wow, you, you, because when you're younger, it's different, but the older, because you revert back to what you were. What, what are they missing? What has someone taken away from them that they currently don't have except the ability to brutalize and say shit? That's it. Yeah, I mean, look, when we started to go back and forth, because Scott started to respond to me, and I kept responding to him. And you were retweeting some, yeah. of my, some of my tweets to him and so forth. And I was like, look, Scott, like you said you chose an area where there were no black people. Like, like that. that's crazy. And his response was like, where do you live, Vlad? And everyone, of course, Googled right. me, and, and I live in Calabasas. Right. I live in Calabasas. We, we both live in Calabasas. But in fact, I didn't choose to live because there were so few. But I wish there were more black people in my neighborhood. Right. Honestly, you went to what the, where the you're the re, you went to where the resources were, where the things you wanted were, right? Mm -hmm. The interesting thing about what he, his premise is that black people and Mexican people were told where they had to live. Mm. There's never been a housing development or a neighborhood development that was built specifically for black people, except prisons. Nobody ever went. I'm going to build. Imperial Gardens so that black people will move here. Black Wall Street? Black Wall Street was, bl no, they built that themselves. But yeah. I'm talking about oh, like yeah. Levittown and all these people that built these developments. They never did that inviting us. Huh. We had to do it ourselves. Yeah. They ne there's never been a development that was built specifically for black people. All of it was built with the exclusion of them. It was built so that you can come and get away from us. Where have we ever gone where somebody built something just for us to come to? Well, is there ever a housing project, well, not project, but a housing community that was built for a specific ethnic group? Yes. Levittown was built for white people. Okay. I, I'm not familiar with that. Levittown, but. Well, well, you should look it up. It was, it was, it, it, Levittown. Le Levittown? Levittown. And Bill O'Reilly's from there. It is the father <laughs> of the modern suburban movement where people this want to get away from Long it. Island. It's in Long Island, it's in Puerto Rico, and I think it's in Michigan or Wisconsin somewhere. And they built it, and the predicate was you could never sell it to black people. Here we go. I actually looked it up. Uh, when I looked it up, it says, why was Levittown segregated? William J. Levitt refused to sell Levittown homes to people of color. And the FHA, upon authorizing loans for the construction of Levittown, included racial covenants in each deed. Making Burbank each has racial covenants. Community. That's crazy. Yeah, so, so it's not me. So, That's crazy. I've so never heard Scott of this So when Scott Adams before. says this shit, he's lying. Th there has never been a... Donald Trump got sued twice by the federal government because he refused to rent or lease to black and brown people. Huh. That's, you, know, you can look that up too. It's just true. So when people yeah. say, I, I, I moved to get away, it has always been the hatter. You know why white people don't want history, Todd? Because you don't want to know your grandmothers threw rocks at niggas. You don't want to know how brutal they were. A, and Ruby Bridges, I'm, I'm 58, 59. She's eight years older than me. She's eight years older than me. So this is not a foreign concept. They wanted to, they, you don't want to know that your nana and papa threw rocks at niggas. And then they make you sugar cookies. And you pretend like when Scott Adams says these things and people believe him, you have always separated yourself from us. Yeah, I mean, look. <sighs> before there was crime, before we could speak, before we could vote, before we could do anything you didn't tell us to do, you always wanted to be away from us. And so now all of a sudden you have a different reason? I mean, look, it's, it's, it's just dumb. I mean, you move to an area because it's usually the most expensive area that you could afford. You know, black people did not move to a neighborhood and start selling drugs in front of their house. Like, you, you know no. what I'm saying? Like, this is not, not in a high-end 
neighborhood. No. This doesn't happen. You know what I'm saying? Like in, in a gated community in Calabasas, all the black people act like all the white people and the Asian people and the, the Spanish people that all live in this neighborhood who could afford to live in this neighborhood. You live where you could afford. If you were to live in a trailer park, there would be a lot of crime in that trailer Anywhere park. Anywhere lack of resources. Like, yeah, he's talking about segregation. But, which is but, crazy. But segregation was the law of the land. Right. Up he, until he wants the to go 70s. back to that. But so but but his notion that he does that because of what we're doing is a mis is a lie. It is always done. You know, I was doing I was doing Jay Leno a long time ago, and Kevin Cosner was on. Hmm. And me and Kevin, Kevin thought I was funny. I thought he was I, I liked him a lot. He used to live in Linwood, which is right next to Compton. Okay. When I said he said I grew up in Linwood, I went, Oh, I grew up in Compton. He, Kevin Costner and people like him saw black people move in those areas and left. So he's a reflection. And now he has Yellowstone. So they, <laughs> so, so I can't watch Yellowstone because I'm like, I know the, 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 that dude is, is not that dude specifically, but that idea, those families left, left those places because black people live there. And, and, and 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 they got to move these places and build these things, and we were stuck where we were. Well, look, my thing with Scott was, look, I I caught wind of this video right when it dropped. Someone very close to me called me up, very upset over this video. I'm like, okay, I know Scott. Let me let me go ahead and, and reach him. And I'm like, look, Scott, I'm coming to you as you know. I'm thinking I'm coming to you as a friend. I'm like your white friend who's closely you know part of, you know, I mean, like associated with the black community, I'm trying to tell you this is fucked up and you could potentially do do some damage control and apologize and, and so forth. This was before he got canceled everywhere. And his response was basically go fuck yourself. And right after maybe a day or two afterwards, suddenly he lost all his deals. Every newspaper dropped him. His syndication dropped him. His book company, he had a book coming out, dropped him. I'm talking about it took him 35 years to build this up and it took him five minutes to lose it. Well, it took an hour because he did the whole video for an hour. Okay. Took it's, an hour. It's, the thing about it is the reason we're here and Elon Musk goes that they're being prejudiced against there's bigotry. There is, uh, you know, a level of bigotry and prejudice. Racism is strictly the domain of a white power structure. Racism. It's a systematic thing. It belongs to you. You cannot, when they say reverse racism, when did I start owning white people? Or owning banks that denied them? Or owning a judiciary? But they get to co-opt these words that mean a thing, and then it actually gives it credence. Here's how you know that America is not the equal place it says it is. If a white man can tell me what history I can learn in 2023, it tells you we're not equal. What, what is it about denying us our right to, if we have inflation, high gas prices, the eggs are high. What about black people not learning black history makes your life any better? Harry Tubman ain't shooting up your schools. Mm -hmm. Frederick Douglass ain't making your gas prices high. <laughs> what about denying us our history makes your life better? What it is, is the fact that you can keep somebody subservient. Don't tell me we're equal when a white man can tell me what I can learn and that be the premise of his, pre his descent to the nomination for the presidency of the United States of America. Well, speaking of history, I got something for you. Let me go ahead and hand it to you. You, you called me about this. Okay, so we were uh, contacted by a woman named Nancy Nazareth. Uh, she pointed out that you grew up on 135th and Avalon. My mother still lives in that neighborhood. She's from 51st and Vermont. And she feels that she gets everything that you talk about. So she went and provided this book that she's had for a long time. Look at the side of it. Look at the date of this book. 1833. 1833. This is a 190 year old book that you're holding in your hands right now. Why does she give it to me? Well, there was some stuff in there that she found interesting about Thomas Jefferson and so forth. Now we looked up the, the basis of this book and essentially this is called a magazine. Even though it looks like a book, back then these were called magazines. And this was 
basically put out by a very rich person who wanted to push their political agenda. And back then when there was no radio, no TV, no internet, books was the way that they would actually push their ideas. Right. If you look at where the, the bookmarks are, there's some interesting stuff in there that she actually pointed out. There's some stuff about Thomas Jefferson in terms of selling his kids and you know his yeah. biracial kids and everything else like that. But it's, uh, you, know, you know, to, when she, when this book came out, what I'm doing right now would get me killed. Mm. Reading this, knowing yeah. that it said something. Yeah. Crazy. So it's, 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 it makes me sad that, that even our examples of history are written in our blood and our pain. Mm. She gave me a book to read that it was illegal for her to have, like whoever got she got it from could have been killed knowing that she, he, she had it or read it or knew what it meant. Is at, at one point, and the thing that's so salient to me and it really gets me kind of worked up, at one time it's illegal for enslaved people to learn and now it's illegal for us to learn about enslaved people. And I get a book. So that 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 is a, well, I wonder why anybody give me a book knowing how bad I read, but that would be, that's a, that's very touching. Yeah. It's pretty wild. It's pretty wild that a book is this old and still around. You, know, and you have a library at your house, so I figured you would you would uh, you would appreciate that. I, I don't know. I don't know my, my whole library ain't this old together. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing, man. Yeah. July through December, eighteen thirty-three, and it was a magazine. <laughs> wow. This is before the Emancipation Proclamation. A long time. <laughs> yes. Yeah. This was About uh, thirty some what, years. Eighteen right? eighteen fifty-five was yeah. it? Yeah, this was almost yeah twenty something years before the Emancipation Proclamation. When this book was written, slavery was legal in America. Yep, and this act was an act of defiance. Mm. Both of us, by the way, you for giving me a book and me for knowing what it read, right? But it got us killed. Yeah, and now the the, the symbolism of that. Right now, there are people who have the strains of that same idea. That it's my history that's deadly. That it, that it's my history that's an affront to your existence. Mm. That's amazing. Amazing. Yeah. This book is, I, I don't even, now I got to read it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 200 year old book. Yeah. Still in fairly good shape. Yeah. Well, you could tell. Right. But, I mean, the beach uh, in L.A., Manhattan Beach was given back to the descendants of that black family, which they, in turn, sold back to the city. For $20 million. $20 million. But imagine if they kept that. You know what they were planning to do with that? They were planning to build a resort for black people. Wow. So imagine if they had had that hunt those hundred some years. Imagine the generational wealth they would have accumulated. No, listen, I remember when that story first, and it was like a glimmer, like it was like a small story in the LA Times when we first caught wind of it. We were the first hip hop publication to start pushing that story. And, you know, I'm not saying that we're responsible for it growing, but we were one of the prominent outlets that started pushing and other, you know, once we pushed it, then Shade Room and all the other ones, you know, affiliated, you know, blogs right. started to push it and it started to get bigger and bigger to the point where, the governor stepped in and said, yeah, we're going to give it back. To them. Yeah. And they gave it back to them. And then, you know, people are complaining, oh, they sold it for too cheap and so forth. Well, that was their it choice. It wasn't worth anything now. It was a lifeguard station because yeah. all of its benefits had already been used. Up. And they didn't do, here's the thing about it. They didn't develop it. They didn't uh, make it, they kept it. They just didn't want niggas to have it. No, I remember the story. Like, at, at first, at first, like they, they started like making laws where you couldn't walk directly, you couldn't park next to it. People would have to walk like a mile just to get to it. And then they start changing those laws to the point where they just took it away from right. it. Same thing with Central Park. Same thing with some of the other places that you mentioned. Yeah, man, it, it, it's fucked up. But it's not just fucked up. It's repetitive. Mm. When you want to kill our history, it is because you want to do it all over again. You want to do it all over again. The Seminoles in Florida, 
Do you know the very first Cal- the very first governor in California, what his very first speech was about? What's that? The genocide of America of the Native Americans. He talked about he knew that they had to murder them. The very first governor of California. So I'm caught in this position where I know all of this bullshit, but I gotta do a radio show, I gotta tell jokes, I gotta write books. But all of that is seeded with this notion that I have to say things that I know to be true. So it, it isn't, it isn't, uh, even when I talk to you, I know we're going to have these conversations. So I can only have them every couple of <laughs> months because I, they, they're, they're so, if we, if we are going to be, I, I, I just hate people who won't have an unfair, an unvarnished, uh, just, fair view of things. If you're not going to give black people reparations, give them the fair market value of the shit you stole from them and we don't have this argument anymore because the shit you stole them has a date. Mm -hmm. It has conspirators. It has people that work together, states and municipalities and and legislate. They all conspire and we know it. Do you think there'll be actual reparations in our lifetime for black people in the United States. I know California is working on it. San Francisco is working on it. It seems like it's still very far off from the point of checks being, you know, You know, know what was funny? I, I thought weed was far off. Mm-hmm. I thought legalization yeah. of marijuana was far off. That's true. Yeah. I thought that gay marriage was far off. I always thought gay marriage was going to happen. Yeah. I thought it was far off. Okay. I thought uh, uh, weed. Though I agree with you, I didn't think weed was going to be legal in my lifetime. This I is thought weird to me. The like, college athletes being paid for their name and likeness was far off. That's a good point. I thought all of that was far off. And you know why I live here? Because I live in the place, and it ain't perfect. It ain't no panacea. But I live in the place where there was a spearhead for all those things. Mm. It did three strikes. It was people don't realize California is very conservative up until about two. The early 2000s, they had problems in 208, 209, 211, 209, which took huh. the the ability to use race uh, for for universities and schools. And 211, or one, maybe I'm inverting them, but that was very harsh to immigrants. And then there was this influx of young people, and all of a sudden, you have legalized gay marriage, you have marijuana that's legalized, you have name and likeness. All of those things came, came as a, a result of this large state becoming more progressive. Everything people have right now is a result of progression. It's not conservative. Otherwise, we'd be what we were. Yeah, I mean, listen, I grew up in California. I mean, I, I went to UC Berkeley when uh, affirmative action was becoming a thing. I was always for it, but there was a pushback. I remember, you And know, they won. Yeah, I mean, Jesse Jackson came to the school yeah. and spoke and everything else like that. Uh, but that pushback against affirmative action in the schools won. It won. Right. Well, because the pushback was by the Asian community. They felt like they were, you know, they went through all the proper steps. They took the tests, they got the grades, and then they were not allowed to go to the certain schools they wanted to go to. But but you're right. But it would never pass. It would never, this California, that would never happen. Nobody would ever break that because everything changed. You could have what, what Arnold Schwarzenegger was a governor yeah. 12, 15 years ago. Yeah. That that probably would never happen now. Really? No. Not here. You think? I not, mean, he was not here. I mean, Arnold was a major Hollywood figure. This is how conservative Huge we are. Huge popularity. This is how conservative we are. Ronald Reagan and Richard Nixon were California governors. That's how conservative we were. We were. True. True. We were the very first open carry state in the United States of America. Really? <laughs> Over the South? California was the very first open carry state in the United States of America. And now it's flipped. Trying and to get now, an open carry is damn near impossible. And you know why? Well, uh, concealed is? carry is damn near impossible. An open carry, I don't even think is possible at all. Do you know why it is? Why? Because in 1968 or 67, 68, 67, Black Panthers walked to the state capital of the United States of America. They were fully armed. Yeah, brandishing weapons, open carry. Ronald Reagan and the NRA wrote the Mulford Act. Mm. So can you imagine a Republican governor and the NRA writing an act, taking the right, writing an act that took the rights of Americans to have guns? Mm. 
because black people had them. Yeah, that was on the Berkeley campus as well. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that. I've seen all the footage. I, yeah. what, my first documentary actually involves some of that. Yeah. Well, uh, Kanye is being sued right now because uh, his school actually banned black history books. And they only fed kids sushi, which I don't really see a problem with, but whatever. Only? If you only ate anything, you'd be... <laughs> Here's the thing that a lot of... There's nothing wrong with sushi, but sushi incorporates lots of different foods. It's not like sushi is like one thing. But it's all they fed them. <laughs> the allegations are it's all they fed them. Not lunch. Not breakfast. I mean, not breakfast, not sushi. Just sushi. And then black history. And then you kill black history. But here's the thing. I fault the people who would go to a school where the founder of the school said he didn't read. <laughs> right. It's your fucking fault. Keisha Cole had her kids there. She pulled well, them out. I don't know why. I don't know how I, any rational person would send their kids to Kanye's school. Like, that just doesn't make sense. That would never even be a thought in my head. I think that unless that, you just want to meet Kanye that that one day, hoping for that. That like, is that level of celebrity. If you're not the the whole institution of learning, learning is based on harnessing curiosity. Mm -hmm. If the founder of your school is telling you he's not curious, then what the fuck do you hope to get from that? Yeah, like I said, the whole thing was lunacy to me. It's lunacy, but. Now, you can't be shocked if a school founded by somebody who is intellectually uh, numb yields the result that it does. Kanye's been pretty quiet recently from doing the most on the highest level to losing everything. Since our last interview, I don't think he's really said anything. I mean, there's a couple little glimmers here and there. Well, he but... said he watched the show and it made him not hate you. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> Jonah Hill yeah. in 21 Jump Street <laughs> made him like Jews yeah. again. <laughs> but let me tell you something. <laughs> Old school, you could probably do that. But 21 Jump Street, I don't know. It's, it's, I just, I think, I, I just, we had these conversations over the last year, the last few years. And there were all these people saying all these things. And now we've come to this. Yeah. But it was always heading here. Right. I mean, uh, Drake sampled uh, Kim Kardashian on his new song, talking about the divorce. And the fact that it was cleared, because I'm sure Kim had a say in that. It's always come to it's this. It's just all just a clusterfuck on every level. But it was always headed toward this very moment right now. Yeah. Always. Always. Yeah. And some people saw it right away, and some people saw it at the last minute, but it was always coming. Donald Trump becomes the first former U.S. president to be indicted. Sure. In the Stormy Daniels hush money case. You said something interesting. You said the first president in U.S. history to be indicted will be indicted by a black man. Right. You can ban our history, but you can't stop us from making it. Right. You know, this country, this America is, is interesting. He's also the first... President being peace twice, mm -hmm. the first president to lead a treasonous attack on this government. Yep. The first president to, you know, doing any, a myriad of things. So Donald Trump has 34 counts of various levels of fraud in New York. Yeah, all felonies. 34 felonies. Mm -hmm. He has a rape uh, civil case, right? Yep. He has potentially espionage, espionage and sedition in the federal level, right? Right. Well, there's a Georgia Rico case. Right. And then Georgia, right? Yep. This dude literally has more cases than Young Thug. <laughs> then how come he ain't Old Thug? <laughs> old Thug. <laughs> and it's funny because now people are like, like they're comparing him to Jesus. When did Jesus, when did Jesus grab women by the pussies and pay a stripper not talk? It's, it's, it's. Porn star. A porn star. Well, porn star. Tri Slash whatever. stripper, yeah. To, to she, not talk. She does both. I, I, is this the best y'all got this dude? It's funny because now he can run for president. Even he's, There's never been, we don't know, because because constitutionally we don't know whether you can run for president and be a felon. Well, you can. I think it's the espionage part which will stop him from ever holding public well, office. So, the so the whole thing with the, uh, the documents at his house could potentially stop him from holding any public office. So he could be convicted, a convicted felon, and still run. Correct. But you can't be a convicted felon and still vote in several states. Correct. That, to me, explains to you why we're in this situation. Because they wrote that law for wealthy white dudes 
And the other law, when a convicted felon can't vote, was vote written for everybody else. Isn't it ironic that you can break the law and still run, but you can't break the law and still vote? You know, what's interesting about this case also was that when he was indicted, he wasn't handcuffed. No. And there was no mugshot. I, I, you know, I, I kind of see that. Well, the, the, the rationale behind the mugshot was that they said, well, everyone knows, everyone around the world knows who he is. There's no purpose of having a mugshot. It doesn't help anybody. And and the, I get the and the rationale is that there are secret service agents. There's a there's a and there's this notion that a lot of people still want to protect the notion, the idea of the presidency. So right, and, and so from I, what I understand, I, the secret service, his secret service entourage, which is assigned to him as a former president, said that they weren't going to allow him to be handcuffed. Which to me is wild because the secret service doesn't have authority over the police department. See what I'm saying? Like but if, the to me, to me, government if this, has authority over the states. Okay, but you're telling me that a Secret Service agent can tell a police officer what they can I'm and can't do. I'm telling you this: that if I, those Secret Service agents were going to well, engage in a fighting, it was going to be a fight, a brawl, a melee. If you tried to hurt or approach the president, and uh, that's uh, that, listen. That, if I was in charge. I would tell that Secret Service person that if they get in the way of this handcuffing, they themselves will be handcuffed. But what is the point of it? That's what I would do. What is the point? That's of what it? I would do because this is standard procedure for someone who is being indicted on 34 but felonies. Most people don't have, and I'm not going to defend that. I, you know, I fucking hate Donald Trump, but most people don't have the weight, pomp, and circumstances of the presidency behind it. I did find it funny that when he was walking out, nobody held his door open. <laughs> they sure didn't. <laughs> and when he was going, this is how you know you ain't president anymore. This is how you know you ain't got no fucking power anymore. When you're waiting on the tarmac and you're a Trump airplane and you're behind a value jet, nigga, you're not president no more. And stop telling me how rich he is when you still use a, a 33-year-old jet. When you get off your plane from the back, motherfucker, you're not a billionaire no more. That's like a that's like a car where you gotta put a key in the door. <laughs> <laughs> right. Don't tell me you balling and you got to do this shit. Boop, boop. Hey, baby, come on, get in. Come on now. Yeah, you said, uh, oh, let me pull this up. You said more people tried to free little Boosie when he was locked up. They did showed you, up for the, tr for the Trump uh, arrest. It was Marjorie Taylor Greene. They ran her ass out. Nobody, more people came to little Boosie's. They, but you know why? Because people saw what happened to the last group of people that believed this motherfucker. <laughs> right, exactly. Oh, I was actually hoping that some of these uh, Trump supporters would act up. In New York? I was hoping for it. In New York? Yo, come on now. And, you know, as someone who still has an apartment in New York and still has a studio in New York and lived there for a long time, seeing uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene get run out <laughs> come on, in, man. in five minutes really brought, brought a tear to my eye when I saw that. My apartment is two five blocks from there. Yeah, so is mine. So you... Yeah. You not feel ready to come to New York with that bullshit. Right. We don't like this is this is how you know when you can't go to what well, there's an old expression that a prophet has no honor amongst his own. When you can't go to the city you were born, bred, and raised in and you be welcome, you fucked up. Yeah. I mean, he has buildings named after him there and he's not welcome there. Well, I mean, but that's why the whole Trump family ultimately moved out of New York. Because remember his daughter, uh, I Ivana yeah. used to live there and, and so forth. They had big, sprawling. They all moved out of Florida, yeah. which which kind of makes sense. Listen, who wants to go outside and be harassed every who day the of the week? Who the fuck is that horrible that they do it? <laughs> right. Like, if, 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 if on balance, if you're you, half the people don't like you, half the people ain't. Yeah. But when nobody from where you're from fucks with you, yeah. you fucked up. Yep. <laughs> Well, Trump said he's still running for president even if he's found guilty. Of course, because they'll let him. Yeah. And he knows that's the only pulpit he has. You know, when people say, like, uh, Stephen A. Smith is a, uh, the dude I love and he's what, my frat brother. But when he says Trump is not racist, that's the most insane. Either you're being ignorant or in, obtuse. Mm. Look, this is not me. He got sued by the federal government twice for refusing to re rent, uh, rent to black people. Twice, yeah. He got sued by a bookkeeper at one, a black bookkeeper at one of his casinos because he said, "I want to do with a yamka on my head, not a black man." He got the Central Park Five. He said 
that they were guilty and took out a, a, a full page ad uh, and talked about break, we need to bring back lynching. Yeah. And still to this day will not admit that they were exonerated and they're not guilty. Yeah. He, his presidency, his ascent to the presidency was the fact that a black man wasn't born in the United States of America and he had proof. So if he isn't racist, you, you can believe that you like him and he hasn't been racist towards you. But either you be uh, either you're being obtuse or naive. When you when you consort openly with racists, his last when Kanye went to see him when he was beginning his presidency, who did he go to see him with? A noted what? White supremacist. Yeah, that was recent, well, last year. So yeah. his body of work tells you that he is, but you can pretend like despite all evidence, you see different because he treated you differently. That's that's insane to me. You can like somebody. You can like somebody who's a racist. You can say he's never been. Pol Pot was a devoted family man, but he still killed a million people in the Cameroon. Mm -hmm. You don't get to pretend. That's what we get the nuance. Just like you, when I watch Dana White slap his, his wife and then get a show about slapping people, is that true? <laughs> he has a show about slapping people. I didn't know that. <laughs> Stop! Like, okay. like there, there are people that I like that have done horrible things, and I can still say you're fucking horrible. Yeah, yeah. Well, you said uh, you said if one of Dana White's fighters had beat his wife like that, he'd already been arrested. He'd already been arrested. Yeah. But Dana White and and Stephen A. Smith, um did an interview, talked about how he, he was on ESPN. I want to get this right. Talked about he talked to Dana White. Who, who, before they talk about what a wife beater does, extols their virtue? Well, just to be fair, though, I saw that video and his wife hit him first and he, like, hit her back. I get it. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And, and I think a lot of times in, in society, number one, I don't think you should ever hit a, a no. woman in any situation. But I think a lot of times women are the abusers I and people it. and people like to just say, oh, she's just a woman. But at the end of the day, if someone hits you first and I've seen lots of videos like this where a woman hits a man first and then he responds and knocks her out and he's the bad guy in the situation. Now, you could say he's the bad guy, but you could also say this woman put her hands on him first. Then let me ask you. Something. And in that situation, Dana White was hit first. Right. Then why is Ray Rice treated differently than Dana White? Because. We, because ESPN and all these people have a deal with him that makes them nuance the situation. They would previously never have done that. Hmm. His mother in 2012 wrote a book and talked about him being a wife of Peter, right? Chances are she knows him better than I might. Hmm. And of course you're going to get ready to Mexico. They beat toys up for candy. Man, you got to beat candy out of a pinata. So of course, they're not going <laughs> to... <not> <laughs> <laughs> If if you want candy, you got to beat some shit up with a stick. Of course, of course. <laughs> so, gonna, it's okay. But but my it. thing is, you when you like somebody, and I've liked a lot of people, but when you like somebody, you can't glaze over the fact that they've done some shit that's great. You could like uh, uh, Donald Trump. You could say he's a good dude. You can't say he's not racist. Yeah. You can't. There, the, other than your personal interaction with him, all evidence would be to the contrary of that. Who fucking let somebody get ran over by a white supremacist in Charlottesville and go, well, it's go both people on great side. Who, bo good people on both sides. Who the fuck says that? Yeah. Who blames Antifa and Black Lives Matter for the upheaval at the fucking... Because he knows what happens. Yeah. So don't tell me he's not racist. Tell me you like him. Well, I think that Trump knows who his base is. And his base is racist white people. So if he ever does anything to the contrary of that, he knows he's going to lose his base. And at that point, his political career is, is gone. So he does what he does based on so don't tell holding me. on to the power. Because, you know, look, when he got indicted, he raised, what, $10 million or something of that sort? Here's what I don't get, man. He was racist, basically, if you won't rent to people because of their color. That's racism, right? If you accuse a man of not being born in the country because of the color of his skin, what that what is that? Racist. If you say these five people are guilty and you want that lynching bar back, lynching, I'm not what is that? Racist. So yeah. it is what it is. Clarence Thomas. Yeah. Who I was never a fan of. 
it was recently uh, announced that he had taken millions of dollars in gifts sure. from a, a billionaire GOP donor. Sure. To the point where he was flying in this private jet. I remember there was this one vacation he took with this man, him and his wife, where they calculated it would have cost him and his wife half a million dollars sure. for a vacation like this. Sure. None of this was ever noted, which was required as a Supreme Court justice. And he actually responded to the allegation and said, well, since this was done in private homes and not, you know, hotels and, and so forth, he was instructed by his lawyers that he never had to well, he actually- he never said lawyers. Well, he said he was- He was told. He was told by- well, He never said lawyers. Okay, he never said lawyers. But he was told by legal type people that he never actually had to let, let me, write let, this down. Let me ask you something. He's the longest serving member on the Supreme Court, right? Oh, is he? Everyone else had died by this time? Who's Bri Breyer's gone, right? He's gone. Huh. A little gone. He's the long serving member of the court, right? I think you're right. Wow. How come I keep being I, right? I feel old right now. Because I remember when he actually got, you know, put into the Supreme Court. So I remember you've been on the Supreme Court for 40 years. That's been 40, over 40 years. On July 1st, 1991, President Bush nominated Thomas to the Supreme Court of the United States. It had, uh, wait, wait. President George, George Her Herbert Walker Bush? Uh, Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So he's 30 some years. 2023 minus 1991 is 32 years. Long term member of the Supreme Court. That sounds about right. Because I remember I was, yeah, I, I was about, yeah, 1991, I was about 18. Yeah. Makes you don't sense. know the fucking rules. No, he knows the rules. He just chose to bend them. Your wife is involved in the potential, potential overthrow of the United States government. Yep. And you pretend like you don't know what you, you. So he's done a lot of things that are problematic with the court. And Judge Roberts, never in the, in modern history has an opinion of the Supreme Court been so low. And it's because of rulings like uh, the Dobbs, Dobbs decision. It's because of Clarence Thomas. It's Roe because versus Wade. Now, listen, I, I've never liked it. From the whole Anita Hill thing that first started, remember they tried to shut down his nomination to begin with? You know, he, I remember he said, I he would rather an assassin's bullet kill me than, than what I'm going through it, right and now. And it should have. It should have because he was an unremarkable. He replaced Thurgood Marshall. Ooh, yeah. He's an unremarkable. Who was a remarkable he was a, judge? He was. He had been to the Supreme Court thirty some times and won. He only lost two cases. He was there so much they went like, "Hey, you're gonna be here all the time. You might as well be a justice." They were, the only reason Clarence Thomas is in in, in the Supreme Court right now because they needed a black guy who was a jurist, yeah, who would be obedient, yeah. and he fit the bill. There was a time in the Supreme Court where you left party affiliation. You started Earl Warren was nominated by, what, Dwight D. Eisenhower and changed the course of American history. Well, look, you can't tell me that my friend who lets me use his private jet whenever I feel like Don't it. Don't expect something. Doesn't expect anything that his opinion about my job doesn't matter right. whatsoever. Because the billionaire who, who's given him all this stuff basically said, oh, I've never brought it up. He's just a remarkable American and so He's forth. He's unfucking Name me a sub substantive up until the Dobbs decision. No, a substantive uh, Listen, minority or majority opinion. If Clarence Thomas didn't take a picture with the Supreme Court, they would think he's the nigga that photobombed the Supreme Court picture. He's an unremarkable. For years, he didn't utter a word during proceedings in the Supreme Court. I mean, look, there was a documentary that was done about him that was funded by the same billionaire. And he talked about how, you know, he likes to take vacations in his RV. They usually stay at Walmart parking lots. You know, he comes from common stock. And he doesn't like fancy things. When you find out that this guy's taking half a million dollar vacations on private jets, on super yachts and so forth, it's crazy to me how this is allowed. And me and you were talking about this before the interview, because based on the way that Congress and the Senate is laid out, he will not get the votes to actually kick him out. The the GOP will not kick him because out. You need they will lose because they know what will happen is if he loses his seat, Biden will then get a, a Democratic judge into the Supreme and Court. And they'll still have him in the court. Listen, I don't even care what, what kind of, like I, like I said, Earl Warren was a conservative, but that didn't mean that he didn't wasn't a fair jurist. Now you have these activist jurists. The Dobbs decision was incredibly unpopular. 30% of Americans agree 
with abortion being... 70% of Americans think that women should have a right to choose. 70%. Yeah. Uh, we, 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 we mostly don't agree with what's happening, but they get to do it. 70-some percent of Americans believe there should be background checks, yeah. but they get to do whatever they want. Right. So we're being ruled by fiat. We're getting, we, a, a man who, was, who lost a popular election by 4 million people picked a man who rendered a decision that was popular to 30% of the country. You tell me what the fuck that is. Yeah. No, it's wild. It's and it's wild. the it's the boat this this dude is an the the, the predicate for being we can have different politic uh, political uh, ideology. I can believe one thing you believe, but to be a conservative in this climate, a black conservative, you have to hate black people. You have to hate them. You have to be virulent. You have to say evil, mean things about them. You have to make them so, uh, uh, deviants. Tell me one conservative right now, and I'm talking about. The, the Condoleezza Rice's and, and the Colin Powell's. I'm talking about in this incarnation of conservatives. Well, right, yeah, because when you bring it back, you could say that Condoleezza Rice and Colin Powell were not self-hating black people. Name me one that isn't now. And name me one besides this remarkable in any way. Anyway. Clarence Thomas was an unremarkable human being. Herschel Walker is an unfucking remark. Tim Scott is an unremarkable human being. They'll never get schools or streets or a stamp. They're not even remarkable to them. Yeah, no, I, I can't. You know, I mean, Kamala Harris is is liberal. She, she, I mean, I mean, she has conservative tendencies, but ultimately, she's a Democrat. So you can't she, say she's that she's a. You know, Kanye <laughs> West is is remarkable. He's in a remarkable talent. Yes. But, but he also <laughs> is useful to them because of his hatred of black people. Yeah. You cannot be a conservative in black people right now without saying the most incendiary, hateful. You say the things they wish they could say and they cheer you on for saying them. Since our last interview, Chris Rock dropped a special. Which Selective I thought was outrage. Brilliant. He thought it was brilliant. I thought it was brilliant. I thought it was great. I thought it was great. I thought as well. it was great. You know, if a re, what they they all saying is revenge is a dish that's best served cold yeah, or waited. Netflix. <laughs> he waited a year, and and it's the most successful um, special since they started measuring them in 2017. Really? So it Domestic. outdid the Chappelle specials. 2017, the match huh. now internationally Chappelle's did better domestically. That one did. Okay. Well, he had the advantage of basically bringing up the Will Smith part. If, if the Will Smith part wasn't in there, it'd be a slightly different story. But for the first time, because remember when it happened, I reached out to you and said, hey, listen, if Chris wants to do an interview about this, I'll I'll cut him a check. I can't cut him a Netflix yeah. check. <laughs> but, but, but I'm glad he took theirs. <laughs> he, said, he got it's way it. more money yeah. than, than with Vlad TV, let me tell you. You know what was insulting about that whole thing to me? is that all those people were talking about, oh, he t punched down on black people. He talked about two black women, three or four. Beyonce, he talked about glowingly, right? Mm -hmm. His daughters who are black and his mother who is black, he talked about glowingly. Yep. Uh, 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 Meghan Markle, it was a benign joke. And Jada Pink, as you could say. So that's 50, 60% he was positive and then he wasn't. You can talk, have an experience with one person and that in the, is not indicative of the whole of, 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 of a race. Yeah. Well, he talked about the whole Will Smith uh, slapping thing. He called Will Smith a bitch, and he called Jada a bitch. And I remember when he called Jada a bitch, the whole crowd just went, ooh. Let me ask you something, honestly. Mm -hmm. What, we're talking about verbiage, right? Mm -hmm. What do you call somebody that fucks your son's best friend and then brings you on a show where you talk about it. Now, if it isn't, so let's take bitch off the table. What is it? It's crazy. What do you say? So there has to be some way to express your outrage about it, right? Right. Do you say this incredibly misunderstood person who, <laughs> if somebody did that to you, what would you call them? Well, no, I mean, me and you were talking about this on the phone, like a couple of weeks ago. It was like, you were saying how, We've all been cheated on, but we've never had to go and do an interview with a person who cheated on us. Right. You, you know what's insulting to me? Stop pretending. When, when Will cried that night and was so emotional that night, that wasn't based on one joke. That wasn't. That wasn't based off a joke about G.I.J. 
that was some whole other shit going on. Mm-hmm. And and then there were people. If the joke was that some people thought the slap was warranted, but the joke was bad. I don't know how that's possible. If the joke was warranted, you you think that a joke is more impactful than a slap. I disagree. But I will say this, that everybody has a right to deal with their own trauma the way they choose to. Mm-hmm. And, and in the time they choose to. People were mad that he waited so long. For you, he did exactly what we wanted to do for him. Right. And whatever name he had to call her, whatever thing, a bitch is better than getting slapped. Yeah. Yeah, so call me a bitch a hundred times instead of slapping the, me. The, a bit, calling a bitch isn't illegal. It's not yeah. illegal. Punching somebody is. Right. But don't tell me, we have these, these gesticulations where we decide, I think that if you did that to me, whatever I do to you to get back is fair. Well, listen, I mean, like I said, you could do whatever you want to do. There's just repercussions behind your actions. Like, for example, you know, I'm sure you've had lots of hecklers a lot. over the years. Right. Have you ever had anyone actually run up on stage? Yes. Have you ever had anyone physically attack you? Yes. Did they connect? No. Okay, so they were stopped before they actually were yes. able to do something. Right. And if they wouldn't have been, as soon as I'd have woke up, the niggas who was guarding me would have been fired. But I'd have been asked. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing I'd have said, give me a pen. <laughs> I just, I, we have, I think that what happened was horrible. I think he, it was an overreaction, but you got to do what you wanted to do and you handled it the way you wanted to. That people had a problem the way he handled it is crazy to me. He called her a bitch, but the same people who said he called her a bitch didn't have a problem with him slapping her, him being slapped. Mm-hmm. I just think be it was an it was an artfully done um, um, retort to something that was traumatic that happened to you. And I would rather be called a name than somebody six foot two and two hundred fifteen pounds slapped shit up. Well, I mean, what's interesting also is that. Uh... After the whole entanglement, August Alcina seems like he came out as gay. Come on now. Have you seen the picture with Come him and his now. like male friend? Come on now. And listen, I, I've been hearing all types of weird stories about Will and Jada over the years. I'm not going to mention them on the air, <laughs> you know, because I'll probably get sued. But what I'm saying is, is that like some of the pieces are, I mean, look, I get it. You're married. You have a girlfriend. She has a guy on the side. Things happen. Relationships are all different. Maybe it's not I'm not marriage. in this, by the no, way. No, no, listen. No, listen. I'm, I'm saying that there's all different types of relationships, and I get it. If your lady is messing around with another guy, and there's some level of understanding in the situation, that you're allowed to do what you're going to do also, okay, I get it. But to go on vacation with that guy is really mind-blowing to me. Like, I don't want to see the dude you're fucking and hang out with him and have meals with him. And he happens to be my son's friend on top of it. Like, the whole thing is kind of insane. There are a whole lot of dudes that are fucking bras. And those dudes will get away because they won't talk about it. Right. If you're blessed enough to get some ass from somebody, shut your fucking mouth. We ain't here because of her. We're there because August Alcino couldn't shut his fucking mouth. Shut up. Shut up. You got some ass. You dug her. That was great. That was dope. Maybe you could get it again if you shut the fuck up. I don't understand why dudes got to talk. Did he talk though? I mean, yeah. he, did, he did an interview at one point, but the but it already the interview been out was there. talking. Yeah, no, you're right. But that was like way after the fact. The story had been. I remember at one point me and August started going back and forth on Twitter, and I was like, "Well, what about the Jada shit?" And suddenly he didn't want to tweet anymore after. Well, that. because let me tell you something. Like, I had already known about it from like a year ago. I don't know. Or two years ago. On. I just need to Irv and 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 uh, look. If you get some pussy for somebody. Shut the fuck up. You, you what, what is the point? Mm-hmm. It's a lot of dudes can't get no pussy because you they're afraid you're going to talk like these motherfuckers did. Right. Shut up. <laughs> Look, as, as bad as shit, what the worst thing, the worst atrocity that happened in this whole shit is a dude got some ass from a top tier broad and ran his fucking mouth. Shut up. Mm. 
Nobody, none of this, nobody's, we ain't having Chris Rock hanging slapped. We ain't having these entanglements. If you just shut the fuck, have that knowing look, like. <laughs> but then every once in a while, she might be in town and tie you up again. Shut up. Well, listen, but, but the whole thing is wild. Because at the end of the day, if you slightly change the situation and you take a man who starts to have sex with one of his daughter's girlfriend he's in his career it, it would be it would be he'd be a predator it'd be he'd be a predator he'd be. so to me jada is a predator right I, i've said that on various yeah. interviews to me jada is a predator she's the definition of a predator you're you're sleeping with your son's friend who's like a third of your age or something like and that. well not even the age it wasn't the age that he was mentally they were under the auspices of trying to help him like it was it was it wasn't it was just yeah. like they were being Benefactors, right? Yeah. On the opposite of that. But none of this happens if the dude shuts his fucking mouth. Yeah. I feel you. I, it, all of this goes back to a dude that could have just got it and shut the fuck up, but he wanted to talk. Larsa Pippen said that she would take Marcus Jordan's last name if they got married. Who wouldn't? Nigga, hey, man. Who wouldn't? Be, <laughs> motherfucker, who wouldn't? What? It's kind of wild, though. I mean, she has a Pippin last name, and now she's going to get a Jordan. But, but she's going to be get, Pippin Jordan. And now she gets to be number one Lars again. Lars Pippin dash Jordan. <laughs> a man. <laughs> hey, man. I, I'm not even, it, like, like that, that whole thing right there, I, and I said this before. It is couples have relationships. They move on. They do whatever. Yeah. Your son is in the league, and you don't mess around with two of the dudes that's on this team right now. Right, because her ex, Malik Beasley, on, is now on the Lakers on now, man. with her son <laughs> after the Russell Come Westbrook on now, trade. Man. At a certain point. That locker room got to be wild. Come on, man. <laughs> at a certain point, at a certain point. <laughs> Can it, you imagine? No, You're I in the shower and you look over and it's like, oh, that's what was fucking my mom, okay? Okay. <laughs> Like, yo, like, and, and the thing about it is, and he's in the D League. Come on, nigga. Come on. <laughs> he definitely in the D League. Come on. At a certain point, man, I would hope that whatever would happen, we would have enough a modicum of respect for each other. We wouldn't hurt. It's already hurtful enough when you go on, you move on with other relationships, do all these other things. But if you doing shit that makes our children, you so out of pocket, you making our children grimace. That's a, that's a lot. That's definitely a grimace. <laughs> right. And she also said that uh, for 23 years, she had sex uh, with Scottie Pippen four times a night. I mean, I, I just, to me, you, you're free to do whatever you want to do. You're not married. But at a certain point, how much do you want your, do you want your children or your family circle or everybody else to be that intimate, like, do you want that for them? If you do, cool. If you don't, cool. But if that was my mother or my situation, I'd have a different estimation of that. Yeah, man. It's a, it's a wild situation. I mean, in our last interview, you called Larsa Pippen messy, disrespectful, and craven. Yeah. What is it? Yeah. What is it? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a fair... When your skill set is being a bad broad, <laughs> and now you're an older bad broad, what do you... Yeah. Like, well, that's your skill set. You was a bad broad. Yeah, I, I think, like... You, when you talk about a, somebody that owned, opened businesses, it was a... Like, like you you were a very beautiful woman. Mm -hmm. Now you're an older, beautiful woman. Yes. What's... I don't get it. And if, if you ain't gonna get... It, like, like, I don't get it. I mean, everything is, is age appropriate. You know, at the end of the day, like I'm about to turn 50 this year. Like I understand I don't do shit that I used to do in my 20s. You know I mean? I'm preparing for my 50s and my 60s and my 70s and, and, and for, you know what I mean? Like I understand that there's certain things that were cool in your 20s and your 30s and your 40s that once you hit your 50s, it's not, you know, you're now in the third but quarter. But now you have, you have a skill set that's transferable. Yes. I can keep doing what I'm doing. When your skill set is big, man, you know what? If no, you you're that, right. Lars's skill set is decreasing. You got to be the baddest broad in a room full of 20 year old bad broad. Oof. Who have access to all the plastic surgery that you're getting, but it looks better they on them. They don't even need plastic surgery right. yet. It's all yet. 
But then again, these 20 year olds are getting plastic. But I'm surgery. saying you, you, your your job is you got to compete yeah. with the baddest bras in the room mm-hmm. who don't have the encumbrances you do. Yeah. They ain't got the kids, they ain't got the history, they ain't got the the yeah. drama. I yeah. could just future's not doing songs about them. Right. Come on now. <laughs> you know, the, the whole the whole night. Listen, I, listen. But that's your skill. Set. My friend John Sally is friends with her. He speaks highly about her. You know what I mean? So I don't try to get really in the middle of all this. But at the end of the day, it is what it is. She's deciding to put herself out there. She's doing interviews about it. She's talking about it. She's being she could have kept, listen, she could have kept all of these relationships very quiet. But why? Her and Marcus Jordan could have met up in one of their homes and gotten DoorDash, and nobody would have known nothing. Who the fuck gonna talk to her about anything else? Scottie Pippen is a, one of the baddest dude ever play. I love the dude. Yeah, but he ain't in the news no more. Well, he could be if he wanted to be. How? He could start doing interviews. He could start being yeah, on but, shows. But he still ain't could... gonna... The point is, her her skill. He's still gonna do all right. He's done all right. In his yeah. life. He goes. Her skill set is being a beautiful, exotic looking woman. But now you go into a locker room mm-hmm. and it's 25, 30 year old exciting looking bros. Yeah. You got to do something. Got to do something. <laughs> well, uh, this was just announced. Uh, Magic Johnson, uh, his group, along with Josh Harris, are actually buying the commanders for $6 million yeah. from D. Snyder, Dan Snyder. Yeah. That's wild. Matt, That's well, what's up. I, I'll say this. He had been part on the Lakers. Do, he had to sell the Dodgers, I'm sure, right? You can't, you can't own them. I think so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think he had already been sold. But isn't it ironic? This is so funny because it goes full circle. And if you're a Laker fan, you know this. So Jan Cook, Cook, Kent Cook, sold the Lakers to Dr. Bus because mm-hmm. he couldn't have them both. Yeah. And Bus wanted Riley. No, I mean, Bus wanted Magic Johnson. Yeah. Nobody else did. Now Magic Johnson, the bus creation, has enough money to buy the team. That's the it's just like a synergistic kind of thing yeah. to me. Yeah. Now listen, I I just watched uh, you know the Reggie Jackson uh, documentary. Oh, he wanted to buy the Dodgers at one point, and he wanted to give a point to all like to like these four prominent black uh, baseball players. Mm-hmm. I, I forgot their name off the top of my head, but he was like, it was really dope. It was like, yeah, he's going to buy the team and then give it to the guys who basically who made baseball, who yeah. made baseball, but. Ultimately, he, you know, felt that, you know, it was racism that didn't allow him to actually buy the team and and so forth. But and, and what, First off, if you got the bread, and there are very few people that have the bread, but if you got the bread and they don't take you, it's other things at play, right? Right. Like Byron Allen got a lot of bread. Mm-hmm. He owns the Weather Channel. <laughs> but it, when he's going to come to the NFL, it's like cloudy with a chance of no, nigga, you won't get this. You won't get this. Yeah, I mean, because listen, whenever... A team goes up for sale. It's not like it just stays on the market for years. Nope. It gets swooped up instantly. And it's groups and, and, it's, yeah. and they get to decide. Yeah. And it's just really, I think, an old boys club and they've decided. Exactly. But but if anybody could break it. Magic Johnson. Well, hey, let me tell you something. <laughs> if you could beat AIDS, you could beat racism. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm just telling you. What did you think about uh, Jill Biden uh, inviting LSU and Iowa who lost? I wanted her to, to shut Wales. up. Just man, look here. I talk to Joe often, so in all fairness. Uh, uh, but Jill Biden's not the president. Jill Biden's the president's wife. Mm-hmm. You doing that? Pick the menu out. Wait, wait. You say you talked to Joe Biden? I talked to Joe Biden. I didn't know this. Yeah. When's the last time you talked to Joe Biden? Probably right before the. I talked to him at the Christmas party. You got invited to Joe Biden's Christmas party? Yeah. Okay. But. Then I talked to him. We gotta um, hang out. Primaries with Christmas party. <laughs> okay. I got invited to the Easter thing, but I, I didn't want my daughter. I mean, so so I like Joe. Okay. Um, I, didn't, I didn't know this. I learned something. But new today. Jill Biden is his wife. Yes. You, what are you? You you're not the one who makes the invitations for the winning teams to go to the. You're a teacher, and I get it. You've done. Pick the menu, decide, greet the people, but to say, what are you doing? The winner gets the the winner gets the spoils. I, I mean, look, I, I have never heard of a losing team being invited to the White House. It's stupid in any situation it's ever stupid. in the history of the but world. It, but also, so, oh, it's also a wife or a non political figure trying to be conciliatory. It's it's it's. I didn't. 
blaming him for what his wife did is it wasn't his sentiment. She had an opinion. She voiced it. I think that that well, but quickly, I mean, you, you did blame Clarence Thomas's wife for what she did. Clarence so, Thomas' wife. Let's be clear. Clarence <laughs> you know Thomas' I mean? wife it's a different, actively, sub- actively was involved in trying to get people to overthrow their uh, election returns. I got you. One is different than somebody inviting the the, the, the trying to say, "Hey, this has been a bit of a, a you know." Uh, uh, of a fluff, Let's, let me, which I think she was wrong about. I think she was definitely wrong, about but it. I don't think that's a reflection. He didn't do it. I think it was somewhat of a reflection. Ultimately, when you're married, what your wife does is a reflection on you. That's how I feel. That's true. Yeah, that's how I feel. But but what I do is it a reflection on her though. Yes, it is. That's not fair. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> Yes, it is. That's where I draw the line, Vlad. <laughs> no. She ain't that shit to do with what I do. <laughs> well, and I also want to point out that the whole, uh, you know, the whole hand dance thing, the whole, you know, uh, yeah. that that John Cena was being Stop. credited for is actually Tony Ayo. It is Tony Ayo. My man. It is Tony Ayo. We talked about it in our last interview. John Cena even said he got it from Tony yeah. Ayo, but he yet did. no one wanted to give Tony yeah. Ayo his props. It was Tony Ayo. It yeah, was Tony Ayo. It was. I thought, hey, listen, I actually think, and, uh, you know, that male, uh, female sports needs that that women's sports need that. They I agree. Need the, that was Bird and Magic. That was it was the highest it was the highest rated game in history. It wasn't the best, but it was the highest rated. Yeah, and it's because it's a black girl and and the black and, and white they're girl. They're both black two girl. superstars, right? Legitimately, those right. are like the two best college right. female basketball players going up head right. to head. And you know something? The girl who lost said, "I don't have a problem with her." Put the hand in my face and whatever else. Of like, course. we were both doing but it. But everybody else. So I just think that that we didn't talk about the game. <laughs> right. We talked about this controversy. And they about need the controversy. it. Yeah. They need it. And LSU is accepting the invitation to the White House. They and they're have, going. They, they, when the fuck else are they going to get invited? When you, you don't know how many times you're going to go and get invited. Right. How many times are you going to win? You got to go. Well, I mean, under Trump, a lot of teams didn't go. Because uh, Trump was a, you know, if you're neutral. He was a polarizing figure. Yeah. He's very polarizing. Yeah. Exactly. The John Moran thing. Mm -hmm. After essentially beating a case where he pulled out a gun on a 17-year-old and that he managed to just walk away from that, he decided it was a great idea to pull out a gun on social media at the club. Yeah. That was crazy to me. That's 24 to me, Ray. That's 24. That's, I said this and and I mean it. People with shit to lose cannot hang around with people who don't have shit to lose Mm. because there's a certain ecosystem me and you together right we wives kids bread same kind of neighborhood if i see you doing something you stop me i'm gonna say hey man that's out of line right but if you're around people who don't have that same kind of you people should stick to their own fucking kind man i'm gonna tell you and i don't mean race I don't mean religion. I mean people with shit to lose. Yeah. Can't hang around people who don't have shit to lose. Act your wage is a term I like they to can't, use. They can't. They, 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 because what, you don't even have a, your, 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 your antenna even, even isn't even set for a certain thing. Right. You don't even know it's wrong. <laughs> right. <laughs> this, this, the, this is how you know it's fucked up. He went to therapy and didn't know what he was going to therapy for. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, he was suspended for eight games. He finally returned. Uh, you know, he did an interview and so forth. I mean, he has his own shoe. He's got, what, a $20 million deal? Like He's to a, quarter of a quarter of a billion dollars. And here's the thing. These young dudes don't get it. Shannon Sharp was telling, saying the very same things everybody's saying now that he should have listened to. Mm-hmm. That he tried to pull your coat. He's a world class athlete. He's been through some of the same things you've been through. Shannon Sharp is one of the greatest people that ever played the position he played, right? Mm-hmm. So it isn't like he's speaking from a vacuum. He knows. Yeah. But it, oh, he's being a hater. Oh, who's this? Sometimes you got to fucking listen. You need to go to therapy to say, nigga, I can't be with you no more. <laughs> we got to break up. <laughs> yeah. You, you, people with shit to lose can't hang around. If you're not motivated by the same things I am, if you're not, don't have the same morals, the same idea, the same mindset, the same drive, what can we do for each other? Now, listen, I get it. I mean, I, I, I remember 
I had my moment with Mike Tyson. When I asked him, I said, uh, you know, here you are worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Why are you attracted to these street guys? You know, here you are, this multimillionaire, and, you know, it seems like you've always been attracted to the, the guys that are still in the streets to a certain degree. Do you think that's a, a fair statement? You know, attracted to them? Well, not attracted to them, but I mean, you like having them around. You're friends with them and you maintain them. I like having them around? I'm just asking. You think, I like, you think I'm friends? What do you think? You think I like having them around? Well, you just spoke nicely about Zip, so I just thought. Yeah. Um, you know who, got, don't know who these guys are? When you talk, what do you say about me? I'm this big, whatever I am, right? But know who those guys are? Those are the guys that when I'm whoever I am is a nobody. I mean, those are the guys that live in the same building with me. They give my mother salt or sugar if they need the milk. They're the same guys. They're the same guys you rob streets with and rob, and you went to juvenile detention with, and then they start, you went to box, and you got locked up, went to boxing. They got locked up, got up, and went to the drug business. And then you see them, and they know this guy and this guy, and then you remember this guy from this town town, and you grew you went to school with this guy, and you know this guy and this guy, mother and your guy, mother went to school together, and this is the whole family, and then everything, everything do is just what they do. And we just love them and got their back, and I just don't know how we got all these people. I say it all the time, how can I worry about these guys dying? Because these are who we are. Yeah. You know, it's who we are. I don't think they're bad guys. I think they made mistakes. And he got mad. He's like, what do you mean attracted? And I'm like, well, I used the wrong word, but my point is still my point. You are worth hundreds of millions of dollars. You should not be hanging out with criminals and drug dealers and, you know, people who shoot people and so forth. I understand. And he explains, like, oh, they came from the same place that I come from and we have the same set of experiences. I get that. You know what it is? But, but these people become a liability in your corner. It is survivor's remorse, survivor's mm. guilt. Yeah. I can't tell you how I used to be like that. You want these people because you survive and you can't figure out why it happened and why all these good things that happened for you and did for them. And you know who you were and they know, like... And all of a sudden it becomes about you wanting to do something to show them that you just who you are and they could be the same thing if they got the same opportunity. Yeah. It's survivor's remorse. But at a certain point, man, when you get older, you understand a very clear thing. Mm -hmm. And people who love you, people who really love you, that whole thing, you love somebody, let them go. If they come back to you, they were your. When people really love you and they know that they can't give you what you need, they want you to go get what you need. Mm hmm and look, you've seen this over and over again. I mean, besides Mike Tyson, you saw it with Allen Iverson. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? You, you saw it with all these very prominent... Plexico Burris. Plexico Burris. Shot himself. We interviewed him. Martin. Like, all these people who you see do things that, that, that you don't have to be... The experience isn't the best teacher. It's just the hardest. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. No, listen, I, I, I feel you. And hopefully, you know, John Morant, they're almost making him the new face of the league. Hopefully he learns from this. He will. And he completely turns it you know around. You know why he will? Because nobody ever almost lost a billion dollars. <laughs> well, Kanye. No, but I'm talking about, that, that, I'm talking about when they're young and not, he, he's half Kanye's age. Yeah, that's true. I'm talking about when they got to see. Uh-huh. Yeah. And you're a franchise. They not going to let you do it. I was just in, I played Memphis last Friday. They not getting ready to let you do that. Right. I interviewed Joe Torrey recently. That's one of my, he's my frat brother and a dear friend of mine. That's what it is. He mentioned that you and Robin Harris didn't get along. At all. Deal and Robin didn't really get along? Nah, no, nah, no. Nah. Deal didn't come when Robin was alive. Okay. Yeah, because they didn't get along. Yeah, well, Robin, Robin, Robin was known for knocking your ass completely the fuck out. He didn't care. Pistols, well, he whooped everybody ass. It's about you talking about. He, he, he puts, he put him down. He, I can name names. He didn't care. Um, and if you stole his jokes or you got into it with him or something like that, he was, you know, Robin was about that life. Why? Robin didn't like me at all. Really? No. Probably because of TK. But probably Wait, what? Robin didn't like TK, and I was TK. Oh, day. oh, it was a TK. Thing. But Robin, okay. um, Robin would. Um, I was in awe of Robin. I respected his talent. I, I was He's the best comic I've ever seen, and I say that openly, ever. Robin Harris is the best comic you've Robin, ever seen. Okay, Robin I, Harris I can see that. Okay. is the best comic I have ever seen. He isn't my favorite comic. 
He's the best comic I've ever seen. Have you ever seen Eddie Murphy? Ever. I, the, the, the best comedian I have. I've seen Robin on the stage with Eddie Murphy. And Robin beat out Eddie Murphy, you feel? The, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to equivocate. He is the Robin Harris huh. to date in my 59 years of life is the best comic I have ever seen. Have you seen Richard Pryor live? Robin Harris. <laughs> well, just answer the question. Have you seen Robin? Yes. Okay. Is right. the best comic okay. I have ever seen. Ever. Ever. And I'll tell you this. Robin Harris is the only person I know. I have interviewed multiple people that they said that they've gotten their outfit roasted by Robin Harris to the point where they've thrown away their yeah. outfit. Yeah. Faze on Love threw away his boots. Yeah. John Sally threw away his pink suit. Yeah. My first uh all black crowd was with me and Robin Harris. Um he came down to host this for people who know who Robin was. Um this comedy I think it was Bees Bees, some 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 little rinky dink place held about maybe 40, 50 people. And I had some red shoes on, some red boots. Um, and he talked about my boots so damn bad when I got on stage. <laughs> I went downstairs and took the boots off and threw them in the trash. <laughs> I was like, man, don't ever let me buy no goddamn red boots. I go to see Robin Harris. I think I tell the story. I got on a pink outfit, right? Pink shirt, linen pants go with it. And I walk in, and Robin Harris said, "Look at that tall bottle of Pepto Bismol." <laughs> Glad I got up. I had rented a Rolls Royce too. I walk outside in the Merck Park. I get in my Rolls Royce. I drive back to Century City. I throw that outfit in the garbage. <laughs> I probably just paid $400. They literally went in the back and alleyway threw and threw away because they were being roasted this bad by he, this man. He, You got to remember, I grew up here in L.A. and the Co Comedy Act Theater, the Regency West was the Comedy Act Theater. Mm -hmm. All of them came to see him hold court. Robin Harris, uh, Whoopi Goldberg, I mm. mean, uh, Eddie Murphy, Whoopi Goldberg, Arsenio Hall, all the Wayans, Jamie Foxx. I saw Jamie Foxx at the Comedy Act Theater. They saw, that's where they found him, at the Comedy Act Theater. Jamie Foxx was so talented when I saw him on stage. I stormed out of the thing and I said, it's unfair for somebody to be that talented. It made me so mad. I'm like, fuck this, it's unfair. <laughs> for, right, because he could also sing and, and he everything He was so else talented. Like but Robin Harris is, and, and Robin, I was a protege of TK. TK was teaching me a comedy, comedy, TK and comedy, TK and Robin did get along. And what Robin would do to me is I would go to the Comedy Act Theater, I would sit there. It would be over at 11.30. Robin would host to 11.27. Right when people were out, were, were, were leaving, he'd bring me on. And he did it over and over and over and over again. With three minutes left. While they were, and I would still do okay. Okay. One day, Robin said to me, he said, I see you, you got, you, you gonna have everything I ever have and nobody ever made it. Like he, he made it, express it for me. And like he, he got, had this, he had this idea and uh, we had a conversation. Robin did the Bay Bay's Kids album. I was the dude who introduced him. Mm. And two months before he died, we got so close, we talked every day. Mm. But it was, and that was a shame, but we, he hated me. He hated me and I was like, but I was CK's friend and I was CK's protege and I, it was it was a weird dynamic, but at the, in the end of it, we had the, the best 60 days I can remember in a long term. What happened between Robin Harris and TK Kirkland? TK was CK, TK, let me say something. I love him. TK was wild back in the day. Back in the day. <laughs> like it's so funny to hear TK talk about him now <laughs> because I know him. <laughs> Did you ever see when I brought John Sally on uh -uh. And he talked about the whole situation over the stolen watch, Charlie Murphy's yeah. watch, and the way that John described it was not the way that TK described it. So I put TK on the phone, and the two of them actually talked it out. And so, so you got to remember, I was on tour with Charlie Murphy when he died. Oh, wow. Okay. 
So I, I, I I've, knew, I've interviewed him before. Yeah. I knew TK's story. I knew John's story, right? I mean, I knew TK's story. I knew uh, Charlie's story. Charlie's story. Yeah. Um, but I will say this. TK got my dental benefits cut off. Right. Like TK, like it is, but he he's so different than he was then. Mm -hmm. But he fucked over a lot of people, man. He was a hustler. He fucked over a lot of people. But to see him now be like this kind of sage wise dude <laughs> makes me want to throw up. <laughs> What the fuck are you doing? Like, we were just together like two weeks ago. And he's so different. But that's what happens when you grow. Yeah. And he grew. And I'm I'm very proud of him for getting what he's getting now. And he gives you a lot of credit. I'm telling you, man, there were very few outlets for, for TK to be discovered in. There were very few places where he could get introduced. And this was the outlet that introduced the country to TK. And now you see him on Drink Champs. You see him on The Breakfast Club. You see him exposed to people. I'd always loved him. Even when my wife wouldn't speak to me because he got our benefits cut off. <laughs> Even when people didn't understand. Like, so many times people want to fight me because I was friends with TK. Okay. Yeah. Shout out to TK, man. That's my man. You know, he stood by me through thick and thin. I, and I, don't, you have, to, I don't have nothing bad to say about TK. When, when he, it was one time, man, it was, I'll never forget, and I'm not going to say who these people were, but, he, a bunch of people came down to see TK. He'll tell you this story. And I was standing by him. And they're like, you and him? And I went like, I, I guess I am. <laughs> like, I guess I am. <laughs> they want to fuck him up? I guess. Yes! Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I guess I I guess I am with him. Like, yeah, that's what you TK know your real friends to... are. If you're willing to get beat up with your friend, that's really your friend. Yep. Yep. And I was with him. That's There's one time, man, he'll tell you this story. This dude... TK did a lot of horrible shit, but he always was a good dude, man. Yeah. Well, uh, Monique has a new special on Netflix. You know, I'm not going to say anything about, I don't even know who you're talking about. Okay. I don't know who that can person I, can is. Can I at least just say a quote of what she said about you? I, I, I wouldn't even be interested. Okay. So don't say it? I'm not going to tell you what to say. It doesn't interest me at all. Okay. Well, I'll just say it and you don't have to comment. Okay. When they asked about you in an interview she did recently, she said, let me say this. I, uh, what I said about D.L. Hughley, I meant it, and I don't take it back. They said, how could you attack his family? I never attacked D.L.'s uh, family. I never said anything about D.L. Hughley's family. I simply reposted an interview that D.L. Hughley had. I will say this. I don't have no issue with D.L., but because D.L. was never brave enough to say, guys, I started this whole situation with my sister Monique. I started the whole thing. After that, we can move forward. Everything he said about D.L., I meant that. I meant that. And I, you don't have to say anything, but I clearly remember she started it. I clearly remember that she was the one that started this whole situation. Something. When you go somewhere and everywhere, every time you go somewhere, a fight breaks out. Every time you're in the news, you're suing somebody. Every time you're in the yeah, news, you're suing, uh, it was a UPN now? Every time you're in the news, I know who the fuck I am. I would put my reputation against anybody's. You know me a long time. Yep. Have you ever, ever heard any... Here's what here's the ultimate test. Everybody I've ever worked with will work with me again. True. I'm a fucking solid dude. Yep. We've my been working together how many years now? My family fucking loves me. Despite the Not shit according that to I've Kanye, done. though. Not according to Kanye. I just want to point that despite out. Despite the shit that I've done. <laughs> right. Despite all the horrible shit I've done. Yeah. I'm as solid as they come. Can you say the same? Mm. I ain't gotta sue people or call people out. I ain't got to argue. I just be who the fuck I am and do what I do. Yeah. Every, everywhere, you know, the Hulk, every time he, there's a fight, every time he gets mad, he turns green. Yeah. But everywhere he go, he tears shit up. Maybe it's you. Right. I agree. I'm as solid as, here's, my children will openly talk about how much they love me. My granddaughter, oh, show me a picture of you with your family. One. Anywhere of somebody loving you. Anywhere. Anywhere. You you can't go on social media without me seeing me with somebody I'm solid with. No, listen, I'm right there with you. I did an interview with Modique and her husband, 
and they said, oh, we just want to look over the release form before we put it out. I said, I'd really never do this, but I'll make an exception. They came back and said, we're going to own the footage and we're going to license it to you for a year, but we're going to own it. And I'm like, how the fuck are you going to own Show some me shit that I shot? Show me somewhere where people that have loved you, love you, that are solid with you over and over again. There anyway. you go. There you go. Eric Holder, uh, since our last interview, you got 60 years to life. He for killing Nipsey Hussle. He won't, he won't, he won't live him, but yeah, he, he got him, yeah. You know, I think uh the judge basically said that he has a green light on him. Right. Uh Boosie said that he hopes some Crips stab him to death in prison. And you've actually pointed out in our previous interviews how so many rappers get killed by LA gangsters. And once it's, again, you, you see this again. It is, it is. A saddest, the saddest testament to a city. I love this city. Me too. I love it. I love that I'm from here. I, I, I choose to be here. It's expensive. It's crowded. Yeah. Fires and floods and violence. I love this city. I hate what it does to people whose light burns so bright. I don't care if it's presidents or rappers or kids or I hate that it has a voracious, voracious appetite for good, for goodness. Like it snuffs out the, I, I just, I hate that part of the city. Yeah, I mean, look, PNB Rock recently killed, going to Roscoe's with some jewelry on. You know, I actually spoke to his girlfriend, you know, who was there when it happened. We were gonna do an interview and I said, hey, can we just speak the day before? And, and we spoke and she just said, listen, I, I'm not healed yet. I, I can't do it, I'm sorry. You know, I apologize. And and I, I felt that that pain. You know, they have a baby together. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And to, to watch your son's father or, or I'm not sure if it's the son or but your child's father to be murdered right there in front of you and they pointed the gun at her and everything else like that. It's this crazy. city has become, it's not even become, it's a caricature of itself. Mm. It's, I, I just... I, I live here. I love it. I'd never live anywhere else. Um, but I hate that aspect of this city, and I hate that it's so romanticized. Oh, yeah. Gang culture is completely romanticized. Crips and Bloods has now become a worldwide phenomenon. You see these gangs in Vietnam and Europe and Asia and the Middle East. You see multimillionaire artists suddenly start claiming these gangs for some insane reason, like the, you know, the Chris Browns of the world and the, the Little Waynes and so forth. And, uh, you know, you romanticize it until you see the PNB Rock situation when you realize, okay, there's nothing romantic about It was so much, this. it was this so, is, this, like for me, harsh. it's so much more. I can't remember all the people from my cousins to my friends to loved ones that I watched this city destroy. Right. And you used to be a blood yourself. Yes. You know what I'm saying? So it's like you were right there. If if life had gone a little differently, you might have been on the other side of this. And it would be decidedly different. I just, I hate that part of this city. I understand that it exists. I wish that it didn't. But it makes me sad that that is uh, as indelible in people's mind as the Hollywood sign mm -hmm. or as you know, the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Like we're the home of Roscoe's, <laughs> the Hollywood Walk of Fame and murder. It's it's a lot. I, I just, I don't, I don't, yeah. I don't, I think that that's the saddest part of that. Yeah, I remember when I talked to TK about this, he said that him and his crew always had a rule to never go below Wilshire. I wouldn't. That that was just all across the board. Don't go below Wilshire, especially at night. And, you know, that's what's kept him safe all these times. But, you know, people want to go and be in the hood. They want to, you know what I'm saying, go experience certain things. Like, I wouldn't go to that Roscoe's. I don't hang out in Compton. I don't hang out in, you know, South Central. Uh, you know? My mother still lives there. So okay. it's a different thing for me. But, um it makes me it makes me sad how voracious an appetite for violence the city and how people try to mimic it all over the country. Why haven't you moved your mother somewhere else? She won't. She won't move. 
She wants to add on to it. I'm like, why? Wow, wow. <laughs> she wants the second floor. Of hell. Yeah. But it's like, a, she all knows. She knows her. Like, it's, yeah. it's, it's, well, I feel you. You know, and like, since our last interview, uh, XXX and uh killers were found guilty of murder. Ain't that something? All three of them were sentenced to life in prison. So if you think about it, right, if you look at the situation, they stole $50,000 from this young man. There was a fourth guy that was like a driver who got five grand who snitched on everybody. The three of them walked around, walked away with $15,000 each. Life in prison for $15,000. Think about how quickly that money would go. $15,000, life in prison. And you know you have some fans of this guy in prison. Like XXXTentacion has, I believe, the most streamed album like ever on Spotify. And so now they're going to they gonna wanna be famous too. They're going to want to be famous too. It's, it's, I don't understand. I understand desperation and I understand fear. Mm hmm. Hatred is our derivative of those things. But the 15 grand, your studio is more than that. Yeah. yeah. Our, our equipment is more than that, yeah. And so in the grand scheme of things, if you have had a broader continuum of experiences, that's a bit. But if you live in a space this small. Mm -hmm. yeah, it seems like all the money in the world. It, 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 it seems like you could retire of that. Yeah, yeah. I feel like. And that that is the problem because rather than having these people think that this means more, if they could just expand their horizons, if they could see more things. Mm -hmm. do, do you, now that I have been overwhelmed over the things I've been able to see. I was talking to my wife the other day. I said, can you believe we saw that? Can you, can you believe? But the, this is what I would say uh, to all these people out there who are doing the things they're doing. Just live a little longer and see a little more and wait to see how dumb the things were you thought were once important. Yeah. The, oh, yeah. It's, it's just so... Today, some lady I never met gave me a book that is older than everybody I know. Way older. A dude who never went to college, who didn't get out of high school, who thought he talked shit for a living, gets to see now I got grandchildren and daughters and I've traveled the world and I get to man I was in Dubai with fucking sultans because I've been places in like all over the world just because of the love of what I do and just because I lived and if they just live a little longer and have a few more experience eat something they didn't eat before go somewhere they didn't go before yeah. do something they didn't do before you you would be amazed how much the world opens up Listen, I, I've stayed in hotels that have cost me more than $15,000. Yep. A, a, a temporary room that I stayed in for a week, week and a half, cost me more than $15,000. I have nothing to show for that. That was just an experience. So to think that I'm going to, <laughs> it's kill incomprehensible someone. that I'm going to kill someone and do the rest, live in a cage with men for the rest of my life natural life, always watching my back to, <laughs> so someone doesn't stab me to death. For fifteen thousand, is not even a fleeting thought. The only thing that I wish people would know: things don't matter. Things. Yeah. I have a security dude, man. And remember when they were robbing everybody who watches? Mm -hmm. I'm like, if you don't give him this watch, he said, I wouldn't. I said, hey, man, insurance covers that. Right. Yeah. If I'll, you, if I'll you show rob the video. Me, yeah. They'll say you got robbed. Right. Here's your insurance money. Yeah, if you try to rob me, I'm going to tell you this right now for everyone who's watching. If you try to rob me, I'm not going to resist. You could have it. I'm not going to get shot. Or, I've had guns pulled out on me during robberies. Like, I, I know what it's like. I know how you don't want to give it up. I know how the man in you was like, oh, or, you know, but XXXTentacion, if he was like, here you go, no problem. Take it. 50000 I make that. I can make that in one show. Easy. It's not worth my life. Nothing but, is worth killing somebody for unless it's the potential, potential loss of life. Nothing. Exactly. I agree. Nothing. I don't give a fuck. And this is not the me 
30 years ago. This is the me now. Yeah. Here. Not here in the spirit of fuck you. Here, if you feel like you need it that bad. Yeah, here you go. Take you it. can't have, what, what you can't do is have somebody I love life without me fighting. That's it. I agree. Everything else, yeah. here. Take it. It's not worth it. No, but listen, I interviewed uh, Baby Blue from Pretty Ricky. He has this huge giant chain. And right before he went to prison for PPP fraud at a bowling alley, someone tried to rob him for the chain. And he fought him and he got shot. Nigga ain't finna be walking around with my shit. You understand what I'm saying? It's at the end of the day, integrity is everything. Character is everything. We Miami niggas, man. Like a, a, a Cuban link nigga, that's that. For a Miami nigga, any other nigga, yeah, they probably would have gave that shit up. I, I, hey, you see it all the time. Niggas get killed and they get robbed and niggas be on the internet with their shit. I just couldn't see that, bro. I ain't finna let a nigga, you know, I just couldn't imagine that. I couldn't fathom that. You know what I'm saying? I couldn't let that happen. I, I'd rather butt the jack than a nigga be holding my shit on the internet like, yeah, I took that nigga shit. You know what I'm saying? And that's just me. That ain't saying that was the right thing to do. You know, I wouldn't advise that to nobody else. But at the same time, shit, nigga be a man. A man gonna be a man. I, I don't know, bro. You know what I'm saying? All I know is, you know, I'm still here. You know what I'm saying? And it's a blessing to be here. I ain't the baddest nigga on earth. You know what I'm saying? I ain't saying that. I'm just saying, shit, I, I wasn't feeling that. I wasn't, I wasn't feeling taking my shit off and giving it to another nigga. You know what I'm saying? And he, and, and, and he was like, when I talked to him, I'm like, isn't that crazy? Oh, no, you ain't take my chain and take pictures with it. And I'm like, it's a fucking chain. You got bullet holes in you. Like, that's crazy to me. I, I don't now, get What it. if you'd been crippled from that? Exactly. Or have to pee in a bag from, I mean, shit in a bag from that. Yeah. Even at that, man. Yeah. I love life so much. I couldn't imagine wanting to take somebody else's for anything other than the cost of taking somebody else's that I love life. I just, I, I just, and I didn't ever think I would feel that way. Mm -hmm. I just didn't. But now, you, you, when you have children and you see them grow and you have a grandchild and you've seen the world, you look at things different. I love people so much. I wish. I mean, and we can have our differences. Like, I don't ever wish it. We can have our differences, the things that I disagree with. But the one thing that if we all respected life like we pretend to, we're not having some of these things. I don't see the need for somebody having an instrument that can kill that many people that fast. I don't feel the need. I don't see the need for somebody to deny somebody the, to, the right to do whatever they want to do. I don't see the need to deny, tell me you, you love humanity, but you let people starve or you won't let them read. I don't understand that. Yeah. I don't know when it's a run, but I'm going to Baltimore, right? Mm -hmm. I'm playing the gig in Baltimore. Um, and it's probably the most fun tour I've been on in a long time. It's me and Sid, and it's Mike Epps, and it's uh, mm. DC Young Fly, and it's Earl okay. So my ex-security dude, uh, a guy named Gary Monroe, one of my favorite things to do in Baltimore is to go to Mount Dobbin, it's a mall, and I watch the Dauphine lean. And I'm telling you, these Dauphines, they're hair and that, but these Dauphine lean, like if they had an Olympics for Dauphine leaning, Baltimore would fucking win. And it's the most, you can't believe, like, these motherfuckers almost fall. And not, and I, it's not gallows to me, I don't go to, to tease anybody. I go just to make sure that I understand what it looks like for somebody else from their perspective. Mm. He's an ex-cop, I'm a comedian. I'm like, wow. And when I see these people, they just, it's they, it's they gig. It's what they do. Yeah. Yep. And then I go back to the four seasons and I lay down. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get a face tat since last time? No, no, it's been here for a while. Oh, it's been there for a while? Mm -hmm. What is that? Is this the five or what is this? I can't really tell. It's, it's Omega. It's a horseshoe. Omega side five. Oh, okay, so you're you're frat. I am. I'm Omega. Uh -huh. Remember, Omega oh, side oh, five. How long you had that? Probably two years. Oh, okay, all right. So it's yeah. not brand new, but it's somewhat new. Right. Okay. Are you done with with tats, or are you still going? Not yet. Not yet. Any we'll more see. face tats? No, nah, not probably no more face tats because <laughs> oh my 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 old lady won't. Won't, uh, but it, I wasn't gonna get a brand, so this is as close as I'm coming. I wasn't gonna let nobody right brand me. I, I'm a little old for that. 
Yeah. And for everyone out there who are thinking of getting face tats, you know, who are looking at DL Hughley yeah. or, or Lil Uzi Vert, you know, who just got his whole forehead yeah, done and, and everything. These are all millionaires right. <laughs> that have established careers who never have to go yeah, get a nine yeah, to five, yeah. who never have to fill out yeah, an application. Yeah. Let's not do that and show up as a barista. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Don't yeah, no, work I, at the I, call, I, a kiosk in a mall. No, listen, in Calabasas, I, I saw a dude working the jack of the box with a face tat, and I'm like, wow. I don't think you thought this went out all no, the way through. Play you, boy. This. <laughs> you know, if you're working at Jack of the Box yeah. with a face tat, Man. your dreams did not work right. out according to plan. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we're going to end it. D.L. Hughley, man. Always a pleasure. Likewise, man. This, I, I got to see you more. Yes, sir. Until next time. Peace.